tonight. We go to the next chapter over. We started the day in Sunday school in Matthew 16 where Jesus gave that promise that he, his church, would overcome the gates of hell, Satan. And then we get a wonderful example of it in the next chapter in Matthew 17. Now the background at the beginning of Matthew 17 is that Jesus and uh, some of the disciples go up to the uh, mount of what we call transfiguration and Jesus is transfigured before their eyes. Of course Luke reveals to us that uh, they were asleep during the beginning of the transfiguration so they were missing out on the miracle there as well as a test to come <clears throat> because at the foot of the mountain a father had brought in his demon possessed son and there is so much in this story but we can't uh, <clears throat> we aren't going to be able to cover it all there's so much in uh, what goes on between uh, the father and Jesus <clears throat> and lessons that can be learned but and I was here in uh, Sunday school of last year and we're going to cover this again um, the Lord knows his reasons uh, maybe there are some people who uh, ha- haven't done it. I, I don't know on this area, uh, especially nobody can uh, uh, blame me as uh, preaching against anybody in particular because when it comes to praying and fasting, I don't know you doing it. <laughs> I can't see you. So uh, on that, it's just uh, between you and the Lord. So we're going to do what the Lord wants to do. And, uh, and so we're going to preach it uh, uh, again, but uh, break it down more and spend more time on it. Matthew chapter uh, 17, verse 19 Then came the disciples to Jesus apart. This is after the casting out of the demons in that father's uh, son's body. And said, why could not we cast them out? And so when they ask a question, Jesus is going to give them uh, a direct answer here. And verse 20, and Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, remove hence the under place, and it shall remove And nothing shall be impossible unto you. If you need to highlight that or underline that, please remember what he's saying there about faith. Just faith before he deals with anything else. And then in verse 21, how be it this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this time. I pray that you'd help us to glean what you have for us today. I know that you don't ever miss the mark. I just pray that you would help me to uh, preach as you would have and also the listeners to have the hearts and ears that you'd have us to have. In Jesus' name we pray and amen. So I told you this morning about uh, uh, Ricky and, uh, and about his heart and life opening up to me and then um, One night after uh, closing, and I was the shift manager, and so I was in charge of the close there, and most of the closing had uh, already taken place there at the McDonald's there in North Carolina, and uh, a couple guys, I think, were in the back uh, cleaning up dishes or something like that, and so we had a guy who really only wound up working there about, um, uh, I think, a week or two. That's kind of common in McDonald's. People don't really stick with it in fast food, Um, and so... He, uh, his John or Paul or something like that, but he was a big guy, uh, not only height, but also just uh, 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 the muscles and the bigness to him. And, and he's up front at the front counter, and I come up around, and he's lighting up a cigarette. And I'm like, John, turn that thing, uh, I mean, you know, put that thing out. You're not supposed to do that in McDonald's. And, uh, and he started, he just thought this was a great opportunity to, to razz the preacher and get on the preacher and, oh, you know what, you guys are always talking about hell and when we die. i tell you what, I'm going to have a party when I die and go to hell. Yeah, I'll be going to hell and it'll be fun for me and my pals down there. And, and the Lord gave me boldness. I had the time and there were other people uh, listening. Ricky was also there and I thought this is important time for them to maybe get the gospel out. And so I went just in the beginning of the gospel and not concerned what his reception is. Because it's not about that, by the way. And doing right or preaching the gospel. Too many times we're looking to man, but it's not man. We're doing it for Jesus. And then letting the Holy Spirit do his part behind the scenes or whatever. That's what it's all about. It's God that gives the increase. You're just watering or planting or whatever. So never forget that. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 3, it tells us there. So, um, so I go through the plan of salvation, and of course, you know, as you can expect, he, he, he really didn't want it. He didn't care. It was just like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was time to close the doors. And then I took Ricky back home that night, and it was kind of quiet for a little bit. But then Ricky, he speaks up, and he said, hey, what was that that you were talking to, you know, Paul or John about tonight? And I'm like, what, you mean at the close? And he said, yeah, yeah. And he was talking about hell and a place of fire and stuff. 
And in, in the conversation, I told John, I said, hey, you know, you are not going to have a party in hell because it is a place of fire. You yourself mentioned it out of your own mouth. And would you just stop for a moment and realize that any time there has ever been a blaze and people were stuck in that fire, did anybody say, I'm having a party? It's not going to be any different in eternity. And he didn't want to hear that, but he didn't argue over that point. And so Ricky's there, and he's asking, what were you talking about? And, and I said, oh, you want to hear that? And I, yeah, yeah, would you tell it to me again? So I went through the plan of salvation again with Ricky, and when I was done, because you never know, especially with this guy and up and, and back and forth, and he said, I'd like to do that. And I said, like, you did, I'm still driving, you know, got to stay on the road. But I'm like, this is the day we were praying for. And so he, then there, just me and him that night, he asked Christ to be a Savior. And it wasn't faith because he did get into church and he did get baptized and he did start coming faithful. And that's not the end of his story. The Lord can do uh, more and there's also ups and downs in our Christian life. But it was wonderful to see that no matter whatever was happening in his life, no matter what the power was over his life, Jesus was still more powerful. All he had to do was have the hunger and somebody who was willing to present the gospel and so he was able to be saved it comes down to this first thing that I want us to point out tonight is that Jesus said okay you want to cast the demons out and we're not just talking about casting the demons out of an individual's body we're talking about even on the grand scale of things of what's going on in this world We've got a lot going on with grassroots organizations and with voting and all of this. And we've got protests going all over the world. But it's not going to make a difference without Jesus Christ. We know that. So what is your part in this? What are you going to do to grab up the tools? We've had three of them this morning. Okay, pop quiz. <laughs> what were those three? Just start shouting or raise your hand or whatever. Yes. You're the good kid in class. You're already ready to give one, Brother Grandy. No, I'm looking at you, Brother. You're the good kid in class. <laughs> Power of Jesus' name. Somebody else. Testimony and, yes, the blood of Christ. Very good. You guys are excellent listeners. Okay. Uh, so, now he says faith. Do you have faith? When the Son of Man returns in Luke chapter 18, he asks, will he find faith on the earth? That's one of the most interesting questions because he never does that. He always states this is what's going to happen, etc., etc., except for the fact that we don't know when he's coming. But Christians need to be watchful and pray. But that's the only time in which he actually gives us the choice as to when he comes back, will he find faith? That's up to us. Will he find faith? He doesn't answer it. That's up to you. That's up to me. Will he find faith? Do you still believe? We said this morning, uh, 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, that uh, faith is the victory. Well, if it's a victory, do you believe? And then not only do you believe, are you faithful? Are you sticking to it day in and day out? Because if you really believe, you're going to be doing it day in and day out. You're going to be soul winning. Hey, some of you, you were great soul winners in the past, but you're not now. And you need to get back to it. That's not faithfulness. Okay, you still somehow or another believe some kind of lie or deception or laziness and it got ahead of you and Jesus Christ and you're not faithful. Either in maybe serving in the church or uh, maybe you used to come uh, more to the invitation. Man, I'm preaching so much this cord uh, it keeps flinging out here, but it bothers me. So I'm going to put it up here and hopefully not rip this thing apart because I'll have to use the love offering to pay for it. <laughs> so we don't want that. So, but maybe you used to read your Bible more and you stopped doing that. Hey, by the way, while we're there, take your Bible to Romans uh, chapter 10 and verse 17. So this is, okay, so, so far we've dealt with four. We, uh, we dealt with faith included in that tool uh, and that weapon that Jesus says there against the devil. He answers it right out. Why could not we cast him out? Well, because of your unbelief, so you need faith. And uh, then here is the, um, the fifth one in Romans chapter 10, verse 17. It's different from faith, and yet they uh, combine. They're, they're both very important. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. The word of God is needed against the devil. Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith, right? So when he was, by the way, fasting and praying, 40 days in Luke chapter 4 and also Matthew chapter 4, when he's confronted with the devil, what weapon does he use? The word of God. Every single time. Why aren't we using that? Now in order for him to use the word of God, it meant he had to have it up here and up here and down here. Why do, you, uh, why do I memorize the word of God? Well, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. 
I don't want to sin against God. And I assume you'll memorize the scripture if you don't want to sin against him. Do you still memorize scripture? It's very good that you read your Bible every day. That's very important. And yet it is one of the only areas in which it's not exactly, if I'm not mistaken, it's not exactly commanded to read your Bible every single day. In Deuteronomy 17, the kings were commanded to read their Bible every single day. And by that example, you know, we could assume that all of us. But we are commanded repeatedly to meditate on the Word of God day and night. Uh, some of us, we read the Word of God, had no idea what you got out of it. You closed your book and you said, I'm a good Christian. I read my Bible today. But that's not meditation. Meditation is amusing. It's taking the time and chewing the cud. It's thinking about what he just fed you and you're not going to leave until you get something out of it. That's how it helps you. Are you reading your Bible every day? If you stop doing it, get back to it. That's Jesus. This is not just a book. This is the very words of life. I love reading the Bible and it's not just because I'm a preacher. I became a preacher because I loved reading the Word of God. This book has so many answers. And I, all through the years, Brother Lisla, I wish I could memorize this book. I really do. I have tried and tried to memorize a number of books in the Bible, and yet I still can't get them all in my mind. And I can't wait till the day when I get to heaven that all the words out of my mouth will be God's words. And I'll be able to have all that He has to say because everything that I say is so weak. It, it's just not the best. It's so feeble compared to him. And so more and more and more I try to memorize the word of God. Because man does not just live by bread alone, but by every word of God. But some of us are dying because we don't have even a little bit of the book in our hearts, in our minds. We're not feeding. Folks, if, if you stopped eating, you would starve. And some of us are starving. Don't do that. Memorize the word of God. I know there's a lot of darkness. Don't lose hope. <laughs> the word of God is still here. Christ is on the throne. We're more than conquerors. We can do it. There were two blondes. They fell down into a hole. Hey, by the way, you got blondes. You know it's got to be a joke. Sorry, blondes. <laughs> One said, it's dark in here, isn't it? And the other replied, I don't know. I can't see. <laughs> yeah. Yep, yep. I'm on the same page with you. <laughs> We can have victory, but we've got to be ready with the Word of God. Now, one of the things, there's, there's a lot of areas in this, and, and we've got to make sure that, uh, of course, we're studying the Word of God. That's a command directly from the Scripture, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Sometimes I'll give uh, some of the uh, uh, background to words in the Bible, like the Hebrew or the Greek or whatever, and then you'll have somebody who says, you shouldn't do that. And they don't even understand what etymology is. The Bible says study. Now, study is not just one-dimensional. It's all the areas. Etymology, does anybody know what etymology is? It's the study of words. So you study words. And there's two different ways in the common, if I understand correctly, in dictionary definitions. You have one practice where you just see whatever is the common use of the people. Uh, like woke today or vaccination that keeps changing according to the government. Then there's the uh, traditional, the common, the best way of defining a word. And that is the root. Like going back to the Latin or the French or whatever. A lot of American words are based off of that. Why would a child of God not do the same thing with God's holy words, which are better than ours? You say, well, I'll just use a dictionary. Dictionary is going to do the same thing for you. It goes back to the Latin. It's going to go back to the root. And it's good for God's people to go back to the root. Now you say, that's study. That's great weariness of the flesh. I don't want to do that. And it's commanded. And if you're to rightly divide the word of truth, you've got to do it. Okay. Get yourself a strong exhaustive concordance. Now, by the way, be careful of the neo-evangelical books that are out there. They're going to mess you up. Um, that like, uh, they're, they're, there's, uh, uh, like some people, they'll say, hey, you know what? The words of mercy in uh, King James Bible, it's not really mercy and compassion. Those are the same words. So they should be the same word. That's not correct. Uh, the words in the scripture, fear, revere, there's a lot of examples of it in which they have similarities, but they're also separate. And the King James authors, I, I do not dare, I'm just a single man, okay? Uh, I'm not single as in marriage, I'm married, okay? But I'm just one man in trying to translate the scriptures. I, I have what the Lord said up there with the King James translators and coming from different denominations that didn't agree with each other under a king that had killed people, by the way, during his same time period in translating a Bible and they had to do it correctly and not according to their views and they did a very good job of it by the way one of the things that I'm fascinated is that a lot of translators of modern times miss some of the subtle differences for instance in mercy and compassion and they don't see it and they say they're the same thing when they're not there's very 
uh, specific differences to them. Same thing with uh, fear or revere. Um, you, you just got to watch it. Um, uh, John chapter, uh, what am I thinking here? Uh, John chapter 14, another word, uh, a neo-evangelicals, you've probably heard it all the time. Uh, they, they say uh, uh, mansions is not mansions, it means rooms. But the King James authors knew the difference between rooms. Rooms is used in the scripture, and there is Greek for rooms. And also, there's the Greek for ma mansions. Did you know the Greek for mansions is only mentioned two times in the New Testament there? You know where? John 14. It's a very special word. It's a very unique word. And I'm surprised that the King James authors did such a very good job of being able to find the idea of a fife them there and that you have a kingdom and that you have these separate special houses that are given to the children of God. And that's what the kingdom of heaven is. Now you're getting silent on me, but this takes work. This takes study. I don't want to lose you. <laughs> but we've got to do this. We've gotten to a day and age in which instead of uh, 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 reading the word of God and believing the word of God, we're doubting the word of God. Uh, through the years, and, and I've only preached at times in Gape and here, when I use uh, uh, the original language, because etymology and all that, I don't use it in such, a me, uh, in such a manner that I'm trying to question it. Be careful, believer, of questioning it, of saying, well, hath the Lord said that word? No, 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 no. There's a different word that says it better. No, 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 no. The word that's there is the word that needed to be used. And we need to make sure because that kind of doubt is not going to build your faith, Okay. And, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with a lot of thoughts to empower us in the Word of God here. Um, Dr. Sharp has done a great job uh, of coming here and mentioning some of the words uh, that we should use in the Christian life. Why should we do that? Because the Bible says that everything that we say, every word, will be held accountable, right? Including idle words. Why then would I choose a man-made word versus a God word? If all of them are judged, which word will last and will stand the test of time? The God word. Uh, Man-made words constantly change with the definitions. One example of it, and some of this stuff I don't even have to cover because Dr. Sharp's already covered it here uh, when I'm trying to help people with the Word of God. Uh, but one of them is uh, missionaries. Missionary is not even the Word of God. Brother Sharp and I think Brother Edwards has done an excellent job of pointing out in the 1500s. But if you look uh, at where the uh, word came from from the Catholics, but I had explained to him, I didn't even know Brother Sharp a number of years ago when I was in Bible college and I, was, I had just only been saved a couple years. But when I saw missionary and I was looking at the Bible, I said, missionary is not in the Bible. And, and yet, you could see the idea of them traveling around and spreading the gospel. So, that was kind of confusing to me. Well, I did study myself through the years, and in the 1400s, you have the Fox's Book of Martyrs. Do you know, almost all the uses for missionary in the Fox's Book of Martyrs is in reference to the Catholics? Because that's where it originated. The Catholics used the word missionary. And now, this is not new stuff to you guys, right? Some of you look at me, Dr. Sharp preached on this, right? I've heard him preach on this, so I, I assumed he preached on this kind of stuff. So, you say, well, I'm going to use missionary just because it's commonplace. Yes, 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 I understand that. But, because we're going to stand before God, and only God's words stand the test of time... Wouldn't you rather choose the best word, not the fallible word? Especially since missionary constantly changes its definitions. And I've had people tell me what a missionary is all over the world and the definition. Why? Because it's a man made term. And when it's a man made term, the definitions change a lot. But when it's a God made term, it never changes. Vaccination would keep changing as long as CDC is around, I guess. But God's words will never change. And what I'm trying to do is give an emphasis on the scripture. And, and we could keep going on this. Don't use pride. Uh, use the words of the scripture. Uh, it, it saddens my heart, you know, when believers are saying, I'm so proud of my kids. Pride is never, ever, 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 ever viewed in a positive light in the scriptures. We need to be using scriptural words. Come on, okay? What I'm doing is having you think outside side of your norms and saying thus saith the Lord and nothing else and that's what we talked about this morning what does the God get uh, what does the Bible give you permission to do what does the Bible give you uh, don't give you permission to do get it clearly from the book not your thinking not what the world says but what the Bible says okay so we need to get back to the book in faith and in uh, quoting the scripture and memorizing it all the time and we can have victory over the enemy uh, a few months before I'll tell you the, this one story here. Uh, before my illness in 2011, it was the, at the end of 2010 in the fall, and my family and the kids, uh, faithful, had only been uh, uh, alive, I think, just for a few months, and we went up to Massachusetts, and we helped a guy start a church in Salem, which is which territory? Satanist territory. Actually, it's the headquarters for the Satanist church. And he had the burden of starting a church there. 
And I went up asking no money, got no money. And I went up uh, asking no meeting, and I didn't get a meeting, and that was fine. It was part of my ministry. I'm an evangelist. I wanted to help him out. Very serious area, area up there. So we knocked on a lot, a lot, a lot of doors. This was when I was healthy. And you have a lot of interactions and illustrations that you can present out of that. But we came up to one house, and it was very obvious that this lady was a, a, a witch or a Satanist or whatever, and, and just, just all over the yard, all over the house. And she actually was outside. And it was preacher's turn, and he came up to try to talk to her about Jesus Christ. He said, hey, I'm Pastor So-and-so from church. And she interrupted and put up her hand like this, and she didn't even look at him. She wouldn't look at him the entire time. And she interrupted it, and she's looking at me, and she wouldn't take her eyes off of me. And she had this sadistic kind of a smile on her face. And she said, oh, we're very familiar with you and your ministry, and we're praying for your defeat, for your destruction, or something in those kind of words. And he said, well, we want to tell you, and I'm not interested. And she walked away and shut the door, and that was it when it received the tract or anything else. And there were a couple of confrontations, and I'm not going to go into all of them after that, where the Satanists were reminding, hey, you're still on our prayer list, and we are praying you down. And then, after just a few months of that, I have this happen to me. And I'm sure that Satan, just like when Jesus was in the grave for those three days, thought, I've got him, I've got him, I've got him. But we turned, and many believers turned prayers towards Jesus Christ to get victory over this. And I never, by the way, for all these years, I did not for the most part, I ever tell anybody about these things because I didn't want to either give too much attention to the devil or for somebody to think uh, something that they shouldn't think in too high of a manner for me. I'm using this to show you, though, how God can have the victory and how Satan is not as big as he puffs up to be. And so maybe the idea, maybe their prayers were kill him because the doctor's uh, pronouncement was either he's going to be dead or mentally handicapped. You're out of the ministry. Maybe he was giddy and, and happy for that. And, uh, and, and their prayers seemed to answer. And yet, here I am. And now, I don't know uh, <laughs> what will happen in the future. And it's been very difficult on the human side of things. But it just makes me cling to Jesus Christ because I can't do it without Jesus. It's really, really made me just know uh, how important grace is and how powerful grace is over the enemy. As far as I know, uh, I am still on their prayer list. Now you say, well, you're not in any big Bible conference. <laughs> The spiritual realm doesn't work the same way the physical realm work, that work. The same people that we make big or whatever is not necessarily the people who are doing things for Jesus Christ. The Bible says, yea, all, all that shall live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. All you got to do is live godly. Are you living godly? That's a promise from Jesus Christ. Also, he said with the parable of the sower, because of the word that they suffered persecution. All you got to do is go around preaching this book and you're going to find some persecution. It may not necessarily be the satanic host, but you're going to get persecution from people who hate the word. And so I don't know what will come of the future, but I pray that by God's grace I stay faithful. And I pray you stay faithful because he's gunning for you too. And I pray that we do what we need to do against the enemy. Stick in the book, okay? Because of the word, they suffered the persecution. Believe, don't let him knock you off that very important area of prayer. But he also said, going back there in Matthew chapter 17, uh, let me see how many minutes I got. Get it off of me. So, <clears throat> Matthew chapter 17, <coughs> he said there in verse 21, How be it this kind? Goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. There are going to be some in which you're going to be able to do the things that we've, uh, we've talked about today. And you're going to have victory over the enemy. But some of them are not going to be cast out or the uh, devil's not going to be offset. And I believe this truly is happening in our country right now in America and around the world. This kind will not come out, will not be defeated unless God's people gather together in prayer and fasting. Now you folks have been doing it for quite a while. I know Brother Grandy's been a faster for years and years and has been a shining light for that, praise the Lord, and emphasized it throughout his ministry. I don't know you, but maybe after a few months you stop doing it. And yet you've missed the point that we don't fast every four years when it's election time and then we give a couple of days or a couple of weeks to fasting. That's not how it works, okay? When... Jesus came down from the mountain and immediately this father comes to him because he already tried his disciples. They couldn't do it. So he says, hey, your disciples couldn't do it. Please cast the demons out of my body. Jesus didn't say, give me two weeks or give me two months. I'll go fast and pray and then I'll get it done. No, he did it. 
which means that was his example, his life. By the way, author and finisher of our faith, he is going before us. He went before to show what his children should do in being Christ followers, Christians. Is it your habit to fast? I'm not talking about like every single day, every single week, because obviously you wouldn't make it. You'd die, okay? We're talking about where you skip meals on a regular basis. And I, I think I've probably already talked about this before, that even though uh, I have many health concerns and I told I'm not supposed to do it, I still do it. I still will fast. Most of the mornings of my week, uh, I talked about oatmeal this morning. You know why I talked about oatmeal and cereal and stuff? Because breakfast is my meal. I love, I love taking a bowl of cereal and pouring that thing on. And that is my meal for the day. And then if they feel like making, not, notice I said they feel like <laughs> making sausage or eggs or whatever, all the better. I love breakfast. And so for me, especially the first thing when I haven't eaten for anything for a number of hours, is very hard on my health. And yet, there was a brother in Pennsylvania a number of years ago giving the word of his testimony that spoke to my heart. Got to be humble. We can help each other if we're humble. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. And he was telling me about how God spoke to him because he's like, I can't fast. And yet the doctor asked him to fast for his uh, medical appointment, for his test. And he said, wait a minute. If I'm going to do it for the doctor, surely I can do it for Jesus Christ. And I was like, hey, that's good. I need that. And I applied that. And all these years... I have been doing that, and it's not easy. Don't look at me like, oh, it's easy for you. It's not easy for anybody, friends. We've all got a flesh <laughs> that wants to eat. You say, well, I, you just don't understand my health needs. I don't, but Jesus does. And he said, this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. You need to find a way to get it done. Hey, how about this? I mean, if it's so hard, when the doctor's asking you to fast for that medical appointment, why don't you put God first on that day? And start out with prayer and fasting. You're going to do it already for the doctor. Why is the doctor more important than God? Okay? So we need to get this done. And we're, we're pushing the limit. I really believe on God's mercy. Everything's collapsing. There's fears all over the place. The supply chains, the inflation that's going up. The believer can stay content, but hopefully not in laziness and lukewarmness. Because that is what many Christians are being content in right now. That's not the right contentment. We, if we're doing what we're supposed to do and praying and fasting and reading the word of God and memorizing and doing our best for the glory of God, whatsoever thy hand find it to do, do it with my might. If that's our testimony, amen. Then whatsoever uh, state you find yourself in, then to be content, but not in sin. How's your prayer life? Did it die? You can be able to have victory over the enemy. Um, you got to stay pure. You got to stay right. A number of years ago, this is not the only time this has happened, but the Lord allowed me to be able to have a conversation with a teenager. It was a Wednesday night. It was the last time I'd be at the church. The preacher, uh, when I asked him for rescheduling, he said, Brother Ron, you and I are not going the same way. He had made it very clear to me he wanted to be me evangelical. And so he's like, you, we both know you're staying you know, put on the Bible. I'm going this way. I don't want to have you. Well, it was interesting, he, he had a young man in the congregation and had been like a demon-possessed person. The mom didn't know what to do. The preacher didn't know what to do. Almost everybody had left. He kept the mom and the boy. Actually, that day he had swallowed something like a pen or whatever, and they were having to schedule a surgery to get it out. He just did crazy things. And he said, Brother Ron, do you think you can do anything with this young man? I said, I know I can't, but God can, just like Joseph or anybody else said. Daniel said, it's not us, it's Jesus Christ. So most of the people were already gone, and up at the front, I do believe it was on the left side, uh, he and I were talking, and at first, uh, he just wouldn't have any of it. He kept interrupting, and he was really growly, and he said, we do not want to hear this, and we stop it, we do not want to. And it was like, okay, you know, this, I, I haven't been prepped for this. This is one of those times here. And so I prayed quietly, and I said, in the name of Jesus Christ, would you bind the demons away from this young man? And if he may be interested, that I could be able to give him the gospel in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Now, I want to tell you about what Jesus Christ has done for your soul. And I kept emphasizing the name of Jesus Christ. I'm weak in my faith, so I kept leaning on Jesus. And I said, Jesus died for you. And look at what Jesus said in Jesus' word here. And after a few moments, he completely changed. He wasn't angry. He didn't have the voice. He didn't have the we. He had the, uh, the, the 13-year-old uh, 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 voice changing kind of stuff going on. And he said, yeah, we would be interested in hearing that. 
And I said, okay. And I went through the plan of salvation, and he got saved then and there. You say, well, I was expecting fireworks. It doesn't have to be fireworks, folks. What is with us where it has to be a big game? That's, I've emphasized this through the years. It's not about getting your name on, a, on an independent Baptist paper. It's about just doing right day in and day out and nobody knowing your name, okay? So, so the demons were cast out of his, uh, his, his body or whatever the case was. He got saved and his life was changed. And yet later, it, it took me a while, and uh, the preacher never had me back in again. And I thought, you know, it was really sad. That guy in his ministry had a demon-possessed boy who had been there for who knows how long, but because it wasn't right, it wasn't going the right direction, it wasn't standing on the truth, it wasn't pure, there weren't people who could cast or even notice or do anything about casting the demons out of a young man's body. What a sad thing to do. What a sad thing to have. Let it never be said of this church. Let it never be said of you. If you had it thrown into your lap, would you be ready? Because it is thrown into our lap right now in our country. This place is a mess. And there's demonic stuff going on all over the place. It's in your lap right now. Are you ready? How much has to happen before it all comes and collapses on us? You know what? I, I, I haven't been telling you many jokes, but i got to tell you this one. Uh, I, I don't know if you heard this one, okay? So I got a new joke for you, okay? A lost dog strays into a jungle. And a lion sees this from a distance and says with caution, Mmm, this guy looks like, uh, uh, this guy looks edible. I've never seen his kind before. So the lion starts rushing the dog. The dog looks up and he realizes, no, I see, <laughs> look at you. You're, he's heard all the jokes. I told him he's got all the jokes I got here already. And so the dog notices and goes, oh, and he starts to panic. What in the world am I going to do? And he's looking around and he sees a pile of bones over there and he gets his bright idea and out loud he says, mm, 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 that was some good lion meat. And the lion, he stops abruptly. Whoa, there's more to this guy than meets the eye, man. Well, there's a monkey up in the trees, and he's seeing this the whole time, and he, he gets a bright idea. Maybe he can have a part in this. So he explains to the lion, oh, man, you've been fooled by that dog. Don't let him fool you. He's just a dog. He's a little thing. Look at him. You can take that dog. And so the lion says, get on my back. We'll take them together. So he starts rushing towards the dog again, and the dog's like, what am I going to do? I've already used up my best idea. He's looking again. He has another bright idea, and he says out loud, where is that crazy monkey? I told him an hour ago to get me another lion. <laughs> okay, get off my back. I'm going to eat you instead. <laughs> there was, a, actually it was last year I told that joke at after the sermon and I was talking about how the devil is a lion and another believer, again, submitting yourselves one to another, just another believer in church and he had an idea I had never thought about before and he said, hey brother Ron, I, I don't want to correct you or whatever, but have you ever thought about this in scripture that it says that Satan as a lion, not the lion, he isn't a lion, but like a lion, as a lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Why would he be as a lion or like a lion? Because he isn't the lion, but he is the deceiver, and he's the mocker, and he's the copycat. Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's not the lion of the tribe of Judah, but he wants you to think he's big as he is. And I was like, man, that's good. i got to pass it on to others. And I told him about that, and I was able to grow, and I hope you're able to grow, and realize that he's just a copycat. All the sins are in the devil. By the way, one of the things I love to think about is fear. Fear is also in the devil. Do you know he's afraid of Christ? We, uh, we have not been given the spirit of fear, but of power. In other words, it's not God's spirit. Whose spirit is it? It's his. You know, he has and he wrestles with that same spirit of fear. He's afraid of that day of judgment. He's afraid of seeing Jesus. Stop cowering. You're children of God. Walk in the light as you are in the light, as your children of light. Walk in the word of God. Walk in faith and victory. Walk in prayer. Walk in fasting. And we're going to have victory over the enemy. So, Ricky, you know what? There was a time in which Ricky was strong for the Lord, but um, uh, he got messed up back into uh, sin, into his drugs, and uh, one night, um, one of the managers, I believe her name was Melissa, I was uh, there at uh, Ambassador, and it was the middle of the night, and I get a call, and one of the guys says, groggily, he says, uh, you got a call in the middle of the night there from uh, somebody at McDonald's, and that was unheard of. I'm, I'm not a head manager, I'm just simply one of the shift managers, so I, I didn't understand why in the world are you calling me, and so... Melissa's on the other side and she's bawling and she's crying. I cannot understand what she's saying. I'm like, 
Melissa, please slow down. This sounds really bad. It sounds really tragic, but I, I don't know what's going on. And she finally was able to slow herself down, and she said, Ron, Ricky, he, on his break or after work or something like that, he, he, he went, I guess, for a drug deal or something like that, and we were on the, the exit there, and he crossed the, the highway uh, in the middle of the night, couldn't be seen, and a semi uh, rammed him head on. And at first, it seemed like it was going to be a sad story, that, you know, he was going to be dead, and it's like, oh, no, no, why'd you throw your life away? But God was able to get victory. He lived his, his just bones all over the place uh, or broken, but he lived. And it took a long time for recovery. But one morning he shows up in church. And when the invitation is given, he raises his hand, I need to be saved. So the preacher uh, sends a guy and I go back there as well. And the, I let the guy just talk to him because take your hands off of him. Maybe he wasn't saved. It's not about, again, it's not us, it's God that gives the increase, right? It's not about getting the victory, uh, getting our name in, involved in it. So we went through the plan of salvation and everything like that. And I just sat there and after the end of it, he said, well, I've already done that. Well, I thought you said you're not saved. Well, I guess I forgot, but, you know, I am saved. And he said, I just don't, I got in this sin, and it really messed me up. And I said, hey, why don't you take your Bible, uh, um, Ricky, and turn to Second Peter, where it says there in chapter 1 about how we need to add to our faith virtue and to virtue this. That's the Christian life going forward, right? And it says that if these things be in you and abound, ye shall neither be unfruitful in the knowledge of Christ. But the other verse, the next verse, says, But he that lacketh these things is first of all blind. You know that's the description always of a lost person. But a believer who's backslidden because sin blinds you becomes blind. That's why the Bible says in Proverbs, the prudent man does what? Foresees the evil. A lot of Christians are blind today. They don't realize the evil that they're about to step into and that they're ruining their family or what America's going through. So I told him that, and that he hath forgotten that he was purged from his uh, sins. And so his, it, the light came on. He's like, oh, that happened to me. What do I need to do? Well, you need to add to these things. You need to get back into church. You need to get away from your sin. And he did. And he got his life back right with God. He got his family in. I try to get calm, <laughs> calm here because it's really exciting to think about um, a, a few years ago, we went back to the church in North Carolina, and his sister was getting married to a godly Christian man. <laughs> I thought, man, that is so awesome. How the Lord saved this wretch like me, and that he got saved, and his life was messed up, but a just man followed seven times and rises up again, and he rose up again, and he got right, and he got his family in, and now his sister's starting another family. God's still on the throne. Yeah. But a lot of times we, we miss the opportunities. We think they're just mundane moments of the day. Many of the mundane are really momentous opportunities that we miss. But a miracle away, but we're not ready. We're not in a walk with God. So make sure you're using the seven tools that God has given us. Provoke, uh, using, invoking the name of Christ. Being under the blood of Christ. The word of your testimony. Faith. The word of God. Get strong in that. Prayer, get life back into your prayer and fasting. And I really didn't hear prayer tonight, but you say, preacher, how do I, how do I pray like fervency, like uh, the, the, the effectual fervent uh, prayer of a righteous man avails much? How do I do that? I can tell you what I do that works for me, and it may work differently for each person. But one of the things that I'll do is that I'll just read either some missionary letters or some of the news, the, the uh, news that's out there, and my heart will break. And I'll get burdened in the Lord. And then I, I will immediately turn around and I will cry out to God for revival and for these missionaries. You know what I'm doing? I'm trying to take the burden, in a sense, on myself, be an intercessor for the needs of our country, for the missionaries. The need becomes my need. A lot of times our prayer life is dead because it's not yours. You're not carrying it. Now, it's not ultimately yours, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. But we're supposed to bear ye one another's burden. So why aren't we doing it in prayer? When we do it in prayer, it gives us a burden of prayer. When you take Mrs. Faulkner upon you and you see, what is that if I was in the deathbed? A lot of times we say, well, I'm not in the deathbed. It's not important to me. But what if you were? What if you put yourself in that position right now? Don't you think it would fire you up? Yes, it does. 
So if you find your fire waning in your prayer life, get yourself a prayer letter. And, and that's why it's good for churches to do that. Pass them out. Get the people to read them and, and let the believers get a part of that. Get yourself the news. See how the nation's crumbling. And then turn that cry to God and say, help us before it's too late. Okay? I'd like to see some prayer warriors in here, right? Some fasting warriors, some godly servants of God. Every head bowed, every eyes closed. Thank you. You are such good listeners. Oh, it's such a, a privilege to preach to you, Brother Lissell and Brother Grandy. You got it good. <laughs> but let's make some decisions. Otherwise, uh, the Bible says don't just be hearers of the word, but doers. Otherwise, we've deceived ourselves. Every head bowed, every eyes closed. Would you please do this? Would you stand to your feet if you're able? I want to have an invitation tonight, but I want to ask a few questions. You say, preacher, I am saved. If that's your testimony tonight, would you raise your hand? Jesus, only Jesus.